Elevators provide a fast, practical way to move in our daily lives. In the United States, about 900,000 elevators make about 18 billion passenger trips per year. The elevator, or lift as it's known in some parts of the world, was not originally designed with people in mind. They carried materials and freight for industry. These devices didn't have safeties on them, so if the rope broke, the material that was on the elevator could be damaged. They really weren't designed for people. They didn't have fire protection around them. They were just a hole in the building or wherever that uh, you got onto a platform and loaded the platform and sent it somewhere. In the 1850s, a gentleman named Elijah Graves Otis, who happened to be a mechanic, he invented what's called a safety hoister. He patented it in 1852. There are drawings of the original patent. In 1854, after the elevator was built, Otis decided that he needed to demonstrate it so it could be sold on a larger basis than just locally. So he arranged to have a demonstration of his elevator at the Crystal Palace exhibition. Otis got on a platform in a set of top hat and tails. To picture what he looks like, is like Abraham Lincoln. So he stood on that platform and his workmen hoisted him up and they took an ax while he was on the elevator and cut the cable that was holding the elevator. The elevator went down a few inches and stopped. And his comment was, all safe gentlemen, all safe. And that was the beginning of the high rise building in the United States of America. While well, you're looking at the model of the Otis 1852 safety hoister, this rope simulates the hoist rope, which were, would have been made of a hemp type material uh, that would have hoisted elevators in those days. If you look at the rails, you see these notches in the rails. They were made out of hard rock maple. And this whole assembly here was all wood. But you see the straight bar across here that's the buggy spring. If you pick it up, pick the elevator up, you see the buggy spring is bowed. And as it would travel up and down, that would remain like that. But if the ropes were to break, then the buggy spring would come and uh, take hold. The American Institute of Architects termed Otis to be the founder of the modern skyscraper because this allowed tall buildings to be built. Before this, buildings really were limited in size to maybe six stories, because that's really pretty, pretty far up to walk. And if you look at old pictures of architecture and things, you'll see all of these low-rise buildings. Otis used the successful demonstration of his safety device to sell freight elevators for the next few years. In 1857, he installed his first passenger elevator in the Howard & Company building in New York City. The device cost $300 and traveled 40 feet per minute. In 1866, the St. James Hotel became New York's first hotel to install an Otis passenger elevator. Elevators quickly became a selling point for hotels. They allowed guests to enjoy the privacy afforded by rooms on the upper floors, far from the noisy streets below. In early days, you pulled a rope. And when you pulled that rope, there was a machine up top that hoisted the elevator up, and you pull the rope the other way to stop it. And then we moved to an elevator that you know had doors on it, that had a gate on it. The early doors on the cab part of the elevator were collapsible gates, and they just opened that collapsible gate. You had a bar that you call it a bar lock, and you pull that arm, and that opened the door, had a closer on it, and then you went to the next floor. Morning, Mr. Kirk. Morning, Miss Kubelik. Good morning, Mr. Baxter. Good morning, Miss Kubelik. That's all. Take it away. Watch the door, please. Blasting off. And this led to operators being on the elevators. They didn't just let the public or general workmen go in and operate them. You had a paid elevator operator, which is one of the occupations that's disappeared. Elevators helped bring about modern skyscrapers, including the Empire State Building. When it opened in 1931, the building featured 64 elevators that served all 103 floors. For more than 40 years, the Empire State Building held the distinction as the world's tallest building. An interesting thing happened in World War II. There was a military bomber traveling in New York. That plane hit the building 
and it went in through the elevator shaft and cut all the cables. Firemen had to drag their hoses 11 stories to reach the flames on the 79th floor as many elevators were knocked out of order. The elevator fell and there was a, a female operator on the elevator and it tore the elevator all to pieces, but she lived. The steel cables that are the hoist ropes piled up in the pit and uh, that's what saved her life. As public use of elevators grew, safety became a concern. In New York City, 256 deaths involving elevators occurred from 1907 to 1912. This led the American Society of Mechanical Engineers to publish the first National Safety Code for Elevators in 1921. Advancements in technology have brought changes to the original standards, but the ASME is still responsible for ensuring safety. The group updates its guidelines every three years. In Henrico, we inspect the elevators twice a year. Uh, one is a, what they call a routine or periodic inspection that the inspector does by himself. And then on the annual inspection, he tests the safety uh, with the elevator contractor or the maintenance contractor. So these things are checked you know, at, at, at the required intervals to help keep those elevators safe. Life on a string, a pretty tough string, but one that must travel thousands of miles, lift thousands of people thousands of times. Every elevator is tested twice a year. The construction plans of every new building must be approved by city engineers. The building code covers um, all aspects of the structures, uh, not just the foundations and the structural components, but also the electrical systems, the plumbing, the mechanical systems, and uh, as a component of that, elevators, escalators, uh, moving walkways, which are also building elements regulated by the building code through specific construction standards. The elevators are one of the safest means of travel there is, but there are things that have to be maintained, that have to be tested, that have to be adjusted and attended to to keep those elevators up. We have approximately 1,300 elevators in the county. Each of those elevators needs to go through a rigorous inspection protocol before it is allowed to be uh, opened and used by the public. So we do that initial inspection protocol when the elevators are installed as a part of the building itself. Once we've done our initial sign off on the elevator, that routine inspection protocol then becomes the responsibility of the building owner to provide that service through third party inspectors which are paid for by the building owners. They have to be re-inspected once every six months. So there's periodic ongoing inspection activity with elevators until they're taken completely out of service. And typically that's when they're replaced with new ones. Those inspectors and the building owners need to send us then their inspection reports uh, once they're completed and we evaluate them to make sure that they are complete, that there are no uh, violations found that weren't corrected and we issue an annual certificate uh, to the owner that the elevator is in compliance with the standards based on those periodic maintenance inspections. The elevator certificates are, are either going to be mounted in the elevator or they're going to be kept in the administrative offices of the owner on site uh, and you might see that quite often in a facility that has multiple elevators in it such as a large office building, maybe a hospital, but the public should be able to find that certificate if they desire to do so either on site or they can contact us. There are two basic types of elevators that we have. One is a hydraulic elevator which functions by a hydraulic cylinder pushing it up from the bottom. Your typical hydraulic elevator serve your shorter buildings and in Henrico County up to usually five floors. For a hydraulic elevator, for every floor the elevator goes up, the hydraulic system has to go into ground that far. There's another type called a traction elevator that is suspended by steel cables from the top of the building that serve our high-rise type buildings. As the buildings get taller, the hydraulic elevator becomes less efficient and harder to install and maintain. That's when the change over to the traction type elevator takes place. The inspection and maintenance process for an elevator is similar to that for your automobile. You want it to be reliable and dependable when you need it. That's why you go through an inspection process to have its vital components tested and checked every year. The first thing we do is obtain access to the elevator machinery room. First thing we do is cut the power off, one of the most important steps for safety. Then we'll open the elevator equipment up for examination. Now we have access to the elevator controls 
for inspection. All right, this is a typical vintage 70s elevator control panel that makes your elevator operate. This is the brains of your elevator. These are fuses for your overcurrent protection of your elevator circuits. These are relays that control the operation to let you know whether it's going up or down. These will monitor the safety circuits in your elevators to let you know whether your doors are open or closed. All right, this is a hydraulic elevator pit. This is the part beneath the elevator that you don't see. These are the elevator buffers that control your overrun in case you go by the floor, it'll stop you. This is your hydraulic cylinder that pushes the elevator up to your next floor. We'll check the fire emergency devices to make sure that they work correctly. We'll check the elevator pit for an accumulation of trash to reduce fire hazards. This is where your elevator plunger connects to the bottom of the elevator car. This pushes where your elevator is pushed up. These are the guiding members that guide you up and down the floors of the building as the elevator travels. In many locations, we have different types of elevators. The most common elevator you'll see is the passenger elevator for transporting people throughout the floors. In buildings with other needs, such as commercial buildings or manufacturing plants, you'll see a freight type elevator. The freight elevator is designed to haul heavy loads and large pieces of equipment. The main identifying trait and the difference between a passenger and a freight elevator will be the type of doors. Passenger elevators will have horizontally sliding doors. Freight elevators will have vertically sliding doors to allow a bigger opening for more equipment. The county facilities are treated no differently than the public sector with respect to the maintenance inspection protocol. The county has a contract with third party inspection agencies who come in and inspect the elevators and they submit to us their inspection reports semi-annually to make sure that uh, we're informed and we're aware that they are compliant. The codes have evolved over the years. So first, now we put elevators in fire rated shafts. We put protective doors on them, both in the car and in the hoistway. And these things all came about uh, as the elevator evolved. In the fire service, we do have the ability to actually control the elevator because you will notice uh, when you step into an elevator car, you're going to see uh, the numbered panel that hit the button of the floor that you want to go to. Well, one of those numbers is going to have a star next to it, and that star is going to dictate where is that elevator going to go if, if the system goes into alarm, if there's a fire alarm in that building. That's where that elevator is going to stop and open up. Normally, it's going to be somewhere of a ground floor level where you'll be able to exit the elevator and go safely outside of the building. That's been the way it's been for a long time, and fire safety has a big impact on elevator codes, and they kind of are hand in hand with the fire officials. And they were probably instrumental also in development of these codes. If the elevator doesn't go into alarm and you're trying to exit the building, everybody else is probably trying to exit too. So it's going to stop on the fifth floor and it's going to open up and it's going to be full. And then it's going to stop on the fourth floor. So it's going to take a very long time. And that's why that elevator car is designed by code to go down to the, to the floor where the, the star indicates. Today we're at Westminster Canterbury, it's a, it's a large uh, nursing home facility and we're actually in the tower. The elevator that we're in now is one of the two uh, elevators on this floor that we use a great deal and, and you can see that this, this elevator is very deep so it allows us to get our stretchers in. And this is actually designed by code. The security staff at Westminster is very good about securing these elevators so when we get in with our stretcher and our monitors and our, all of our EMS equipment, you know, they're already here. They've got this elevator locked out. So we move our stretcher into the elevator, they lock it out, and we go directly to the floor where the patient is without having to stop at every floor. If we don't have the ability to get a, a, our stretcher into these elevators, you know, we have to fold the, the top all the way up and collapse the, uh, the bottom part of the stretcher all the way in. And if there's a patient on that, it doesn't allow for a good patient transfer. If you're ever stuck in an elevator, it's really important not to panic. You know, most people are going to have cell phones. There are telephone options in these elevators that you can use. There's actually two sets of doors here. There's one for the car itself, and there's another one for the outside that's going to be in the hallway that doesn't actually move. So there's two doors that we have to access to get to a patient, and we understand that, but we're not experts in elevators. We know a lot about them. We've had training but the elevator companies are on contract to be there usually somewhere around the 30 minute window when there's someone stuck in an elevator and they're going to know every in and every out and every safety aspect of that elevator. Once considered a luxury for high-rise hotels and office buildings, the elevator is now gaining popularity among homeowners. 
Around the 2010-2011 time period, we started seeing elevators become more and more popular. These are small residential elevators. They're not going to move tons of furniture up and things like that. Uh, not quite as fast as the commercial ones, but uh, again, very adequate for what they do. We are having every demographic ask for them, not just the elderly like people may think. With the urban mixed use developments, the houses are getting a smaller footprint, but they're getting taller. And what that results in is people installing residential elevators based on the fact that these things are typically four stories in height. An interesting project that we've recently completed was in, was in Ryko's tallest building, 5100 Monument. It used to be apartments and turned into condos. The elevators were about 60 years old, and uh, we upgraded those elevators to modern standards. Probably saved 50% in power. Uh, it's much more efficient, much more reliable, and it was really a lot uh, of satisfaction seeing those elevators be turned over and seeing how the people enjoyed using them. Elevators, statistically, are very safe. Um, it certainly is true in Henrico as well. The safety issues that people have with elevators more often than not are as a result of not using the elevator the way it was intended or designed to be used by the manufacturer. So as long as you're punching the buttons, getting on the car, and then getting off once you get to your destination, you should feel very safe on the elevator. Mm -hmm.